Let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 8. <clears throat> eighth, eighth chapter of Genesis. Excuse me. I better do this before we go too far. If we were to add up all of the begats that we've had so far, and we would assume that there's nothing omitted, and, and we cipher that all together, uh, we come up with 1,656 years after the creation of Adam. We find ourselves in the world being destroyed in a flood. And um, I showed this last time, this kind of a... Oh, something's not clicking, Hank. Um, this timeline of the flood period, uh, sometimes we just think of Noah being out there with his family for a few days and then it rained and then, uh, you know, the 40 days and 40 nights kind of gets embedded into our head and we think that was the lifetime, uh, the uh, life of the flood period. But it was basically, that's all it rained. It rained 40 days and 40 nights and uh, they were actually spent over a year um, in the uh, ark altogether. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 8, Then the Lord... Then God remembered Noah and every living thing. You know, it wasn't the sort of, when God talks about God remembering somebody, it's not the idea that uh, he goes, oh, I wonder whatever happened. Oh, what's his name? You know, it's just, I forgot all about him. But it's kind of the, not, not the idea of like when you turn on your, you're going to run yourself a hot bath and then while it's filling up, you go do some other things and you go, Oops, oh gosh, I've overflowed, the, I've overflowed the world. I forgot to turn the spigots off. You know, it wasn't that kind of remembering. Uh, it was just uh, that uh, he gave attention to uh, the Lord and all the living uh, creatures that were on the ark, all the animals that were with him. And the Lord made a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. You know, there's a whole lot of firsts that I think we'll see in our text tonight um, that we probably weren't aware of or that, or that uh, Noah and his family weren't. Uh, just first-time occurrences that we would today take as an everyday kind of a thing. Uh, the wind coming along, a strong wind that would dry things out. We, you know, we live in Oklahoma. Uh, we get strong winds 11 months out of the year, you know, except for in July. Uh, that's about the only time we don't have them. Um, and it says that God made a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the uh, windows of heaven were also stopped and the rain of the earth was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth at the end of 150 days. The waters decreased. So after a, uh, 150 days, almost a half a year, then the waters began to subside. And it says the ark rested on the seventh month, 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, so another two and a half months they spend in it, the tops of the mountains were seen. Um, <clears throat> there are, uh, in, in, the, the, in my lifetime, we would say, in the last several decades, there have been a number of attempts, different expeditions of people that have gone uh, to the ark to try to, in some way, see if they could locate it. Maybe you've been familiar with some of these. This is what's known as the Ark Anomaly. It was the result of an air airplane that was flying over the area in 1949, and they took a picture of it. And um, the, the uh, Turkish government, this is on one of the ridges of Ararat, and the Turkish government has prohibited any kind of uh, uh, expeditions to go up and uh, explain it. Most of the geologists, though, explain that this shape that you see that's kind of could be considered to be arc shape or boat shape, uh, changes with the temperatures and the ice and, and the snowfall. You know, when the sun's in the right condition, right angle, and you got just the right amount of snowfall, then it kind of looks like an arc. So whether there's something that's there or not, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, then there is the Durapinar formation. Uh, this was discovered in 1948 after uh, this area is very much subject to earthquakes, and they had an earthquake, and... Um, there was uh, some very heavy rains, and this kind of a arc-shaped formation seemed to kind of appear. It's been designated as a national park in Turkey, which I think in the Turkish language translates as tourist trap. Uh, and uh, if you're familiar with the work of Ron White, kind of a zudo archaeologist of a generation ago, he died in 99, but uh, he was really big on that, and he was kind of responsible for, responsible for popularizing this area. Uh, and... Um, 
you know, whether there's anything there or not is just anyone's guess. Uh, this is a video that was, uh, there was a video, this is just a picture of the video, but there was a video that was uh, produced early in the 21st century from a joint uh, Chinese, they were from Hong Kong, and Turkish believers organization that actually said that they found the ark. In fact, they had this video footage of them going on the inside of it and examining the inside. And you can see they're inside this wooden kind of uh, vessel of some kind. Uh, and yet that was later exposed to be a fraud as they tested the wood. It was all pretty recent. And they even were able to find somewhat of a paper trail of where they got the wood and, and brought it to uh, put it up there so they could kind of uh, produce some sort of hoax. Uh, in um, 2006, they discovered these beam-shaped rocks that are also, this is actually in Iran. It's uh, probably 150, 200 miles east of where the traditional site of Mount Ararat is. And Bob Kranukian and many other guys have um, drawn attention to how that looks like petrified wood. Like this could be the panels and planks of, of some very ancient wooden vessel that has now been petrified into wood. Um, but uh, again, archeologists that have studied this and looked around, they find other similar strata in the same area that, uh, that they say is not uh, petrified stones in any uh, shape. Uh, and this area is rife with volcanic, as I said, it's very prone to earthquakes. Uh, there are active volcanoes. In fact, the Mount Ararat itself is a volcano and it's uh, erupted several times. In fact, if you look at an aerial view of the, of the, the peak of the highest mountain range uh, or mountain peak in the range, uh, you can see where it looks like Mount St. Helens, where site of it's kind of been blown away and the peak's not there anymore. Um, and the most recent uh, eruption of it was a couple hundred years ago. But with that and the idea that there's a bunch of glacial activity going on in the area uh, that would change the landscape very dramatically, you know, it, it's, I, I think, I mean, Mount Ararat may not even be in the same place as it was when the uh, ark landed, much less would the ark still be there with all of the shifting of the earth's surface and stuff, uh, stuff like that. It would have destroyed any kind of remains of the vessel, I believe. Um, and then also when they first let, get off of the ark, one of the things, everything's been pretty much ruined. You know, the earth has been, I mean, it's scorched earth, only drenched earth, but I mean, there's nothing left, you know, and, and the ark would have provided wood for housing and also for fuel. So uh, it's doubtful that it would have survived the elements for almost five millennia, uh, much less the idea of the repurposing of the wood. It would have been very valuable in that time. So I, to me, it makes no difference whether any of these places would prove to be the location of the ark or not. My faith is not based upon archaeology. Uh, my faith is based upon Jesus, and I believe what the Bible says is true, uh, not some uh, very fuzzy aerial photos. So, uh, I, you know, personally, I don't know that the Lord is really into pres uh, preserving these kind of relics because we tend to kind of worship them anyway. So uh, the ark was there, uh, and whether it still is or not is really kind of irrelevant. And it says in verse 6, it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. And so he sends out a raven first, which they're kind of, uh, they're uh, meat eaters, you know, they're omnivores, but they, li they like meat. And so there would have been the rotting carcasses, they're kind of scavenger type birds and, and opportunistic meat eaters. And the raven flew around until it found some mold carcass uh, in a mudslide and, and never came back. Uh, but then he also sent out a dove, he says in verse 8, to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him. So the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out uh, his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself, and he wait, waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent the do uh, dove from the ark. And then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So not all of the trees uh, had been destroyed. They found uh, a, a fresh olive branch. Uh, it was probably pretty encouraging. Uh, and so he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove. 
and then she didn't return. She didn't come back to him anymore. Uh, so by this time, they've been in the ark for over uh, almost a year, and it came to pass in the 601st year. This would have been in his, he was 600 years old on, the, on his birthday, um, in, or in the first year, the first month, the first day, that the waters were dried up from the earth. Kind of a cool birthday present, you know, to, uh, when you're 600 years old, to finally have some dry ground. It says, Noah removed the covering of the ark. You can imagine it probably, you know, when they undid it, it's like this big vacuum seal sound, you know, like, and, and their first breath of fresh air uh, in many, many, many months. And it says, uh, indeed, the surface of the ground was dry. They'd been in the ark for uh, 330 days at this time. Uh, you can imagine they're probably feeling cabin fever or ark fever, I guess the case would be. Um, and uh, it says that uh, in the next verse, he waited another uh, almost two months before he comes out. Now, the ground's dry. They've been in the ark for a bunch of days, a bunch of months. And, and there would be no reason for them not to leave the ark. And after all of that time being cramped in these very tight living quarters, and you can imagine what the smell inside this place had become like, uh, and he stays in the ark for another two months. Why is that? Why would he do that? And he says in verse 15, and then God spoke to Noah saying, you know, one of the things that Noah had learned through this 120-year thing of him obeying and walking with the Lord and obeying his commands is he waited for his marching orders. Uh, he, he had his instructions on what to do. And so he was just waiting for God had told him what to do up to this point, And he had uh, full faith that God would do it from then on. And so in verse 16, it says, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives with you. You know, in the beginning, when we first last time when we were uh, after the ark was built and the Lord had called him and he, he said to Adam, uh, come, come into the ark. You know, that was the instruction. That it was almost implied as though the Lord was inside the ark. He was saying, come on, come into my pad, you know, come on into my house. And now he's telling him, once he's come, he's come. Now he's saying, I want you to go. Um, you know, the ark is a place of sanctuary. Uh, it's a place of solace. It's a place of, uh, of comfort from the world that is full of trial and tribulation. Uh, you know, the ark is this place where, where uh, he and we, by extension, can be saved from the storms of the earth. And, and it's kind of like the way God does things is once we have come to that place where we have experienced that solace and that protection and that comfort, uh, then he wants to use us to be vessels of that same thing. He wants us to go out and be an ark for somebody else. I love the story from, of Elijah back in 1 Kings chapter 19 where he had been duking it out with the prophets of Baal. Remember, he called down fire from heaven. And I mean, just great, great, awesome spiritual victory. And, and uh, you know, as he was seeing the fire from the Lord come down and consuming uh, the prophets of Baal, he was just like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, you know. And then he got word that Jezebel was out to get him. And he ran. And he ran for a long time. He went all the way from Mount Carmel, which is in the north, uh, up near uh, Galilee area. Uh, he ran all the way from up there down into the Negev, down in the south, because he wanted to make sure he was far from the reach of Jezebel. And it says that this angel came and ministered to him. He was hanging out under the, this tree. And this angel came to him, and he, the angel baked a cake on some coals and gave him a bottle of water and re renewed his strength a little bit. And then the angel says, you know, go ahead and rest some more and eat some more and drink some more because you got a pretty hard journey ahead of you. And so he went back to sleep again. And once his strength was renewed, after he'd had that time of restoration, and this angel had come and ministered to his physical needs. Then the angel, uh, or the, the Lord spoke to him and said, okay, now I want you to get up. I've got some work for you to do. I want you to go and uh, anoint the king uh, in Damascus and, and the other instructions that he gave him. You know, once he had received that solace and that comfort uh, and that protection, that preservation, then he wanted him to go and be his vessel once again. Paul says something similar to that in 2 Corinthians in the introduction in Jeff, uh, Chapter 1, verse 4, he says, talking about God, he said, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
So one time, some one of the things that God does with the trials and tribulations of of this earth is that not only does he show us that he will preserve us, he will protect us, that he has overcome the world. In the world, we will have tribulations, but we can be of good cheer because he has overcome it. We learn that by the fact that he is faithful during our tribulations and that God wants to use us to be vessels uh, for his use in sharing that same comfort with others. And so God continues his instructions in verse 17. He says, bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh that is with you birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may be they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth so the lord went out his sons and his wife and his sons wives with him and every bird every creeping thing uh, or every animal every creeping thing every bird and whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark um <laughs> I don't know if you are very familiar with this or not, but it's been about almost about 20 years ago they uh, finished Matt. They they started this thing called the Genome Project when they first started understanding somewhat about DNA and how it works, and how it's passed on, and everything. They began this genome mapping project. I don't know what I'm talking about right now, so uh, I, you know this is way far over my head. But I remember uh, when they had completed that, when they, they, it was a several-year project, and when they finally had done mapping the DNA of, of human existence, I was reading this article, and it said that they had come to the understanding that all humans on Earth, every human being on Earth, had descended from a common mother. And I read this, and I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And then the article went on to say, and the scientists say this is proof of evolution. And I was like, wait, what? What? Uh, but, you know, yeah, there was all these monkeys going around, you know, be bopping around the earth. And then there was one of them that one day popped out a, bo a baby boy. And then I guess she again popped out a baby girl. And that was the beginning of all mankind. And the mapping of the genome project in their minds proved this. Uh, but, you know, one of the things when you get the scientific community talking brass tacks, uh, they will confess, they will admit that the Darwinian evolution as it's been viewed for the last almost 200 years is completely untenable and that, that it has failed. And that all mankind does come from a common mother, but it was Eve through these eight people that survived uh, the worldwide flood. And so it says in verse 20, something very interesting. This is the first time we see a reference of that, that Noah built an altar to the Lord. I'm not sure where Noah had gotten this, if it had been passed down from Adam and then to Seth and then all the way to, you know, uh, to Methuselah and on down to Noah. Um, maybe, you know, it appears as though there was something like that with, in chapter 2 with uh, Abel. Uh, but this was a, a burnt offering. And it says that he built an altar to, the, altar to the Lord, and he took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Uh, the burnt offering was the one that just is the sort of thing like, God, you rock, and I am just being totally, completely consecrated to you. And so the burnt offering was one which, you know, most of the offerings, they had the peace offerings and the sin offerings and the fellowship and all these sort of things. But in most of those, that you would keep back a portion of the meat, and it would either be shared with the priest or they would have like a big potluck right there at the door of the tabernacle um, or something along those lines. But the burnt offering, it was one that you put on the altar and it was totally burned up. And it speaks of total and complete consecration. And so God had told Adam to take, or Noah, to take, seven each one of these clean animals uh, and when the whole thing was over over a year later uh, he takes them and offers them as um, not all of them obviously because then they wouldn't have any more clean animals but he took the animals and offered them as a burnt offering and it says that and the Lord verse 21 smelled a soothing aroma uh now, if, if you're if you're vegan, you know my heart goes out to you. I'm you, it's, it, it's it's totally okay. And if you're you know somewhat a vegetarian, or if you're just one of these like fish and white meat kind of people, that's okay too. But I dig the smell of a barbecue. I mean, there's just nothing like the smell of ribs or a good steak on the barbie. Um, and it says that God does too. You know, it says that it was a soothing aroma for God as He smelled the sacrifice being offered up before him. 
but it wasn't that because it was a barbecue that was a soothing aroma to God. You know, he wasn't like, oh boy, that's my favorite kind of rub. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't because of that. It was because that, I mean, this, this, the, the blood of the sacrifice, and we're going to see him go into this uh, in a little bit, but the blood of, the, of uh, uh, the sacrifice was a constant reminder. The idea that an animal had to give its life was a constant reminder. There, this was an animal that was on this altar being uh, barbecued, and it, that was a constant reminder of the cost of sin. And no one understood this better than God. You know, no one understands. We think we understand because we felt the guilt of sin, but no one understands the, the guilt and the price of sin than God does. And, and yet he called that a soothing aroma. As it, and, and he would know with every sacrifice that had ever been offered from, from Adam and Eve all the way up until the present time, uh, and even into to, or the present time of our text or on into the present day, every offering that had ever been done was a reminder that one day his son would be the offering to take away sin. That the day would come when he would be offering his son uh, on the altar. How could he call that a soothing aroma? And the only way I can understand it is because he understood the victory that would come from it. He knew that by Christ's sacrifice, by giving his own son as a total consecration offering, that it was a soothing aroma because it would do away with the penalty of sin and bring us back into fellowship with him. And so then the Lord said in his heart, I'll never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I've done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. And so he brings this, that's the beginning of what's called the Noahic covenant, where he says, in verse 1 of chapter 9, So God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, I, I don't know that it takes a lot of explanation, but I think it would bear bringing out that when the Bible says to be fruitful, it means more than having babies. You know, and that, that's just not, that's not simply God's desire. That's not really, that, that would not fulfill the charge of being fruitful. It means more than just simply having kids but it's to bring in that next generation and then to train them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord so that they in turn we bring in the next generation. And he says, be multiply uh, or be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air and all that move on the earth, on all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. So he's reiterating what he had told to Adam when he first put him in the garden, that he's given them dominion over the earth. Uh, not sovereign potency over the earth. They, they, were, they weren't there to rape and pillage and do with as they wanted, but they were given a stewardship of the earth, uh, beginning with the, with the children. You know, the, we say there are kids, but they're not our kids. Uh, they're his kids that he gives us as a stewardship. And what he is saying to Noah and his sons, and uh, as he makes this covenant with them, is I am giving the earth to you, but it's my earth that I'm going to entrust to you that you can uh, have control over, uh, but it's a stewardship that I want you to be faithful with. Because he says in verse 3, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I've given you all things, even the green herbs. You know, if somebody wants to be vegetarian, it's fine. you got a proof text for that right there. He says green herbs. He's given them to you. Uh, you can have your salad. That's fine. But he also says that he gives every moving thing as food. And, and, uh, I like the ones that move. That's, that's good stuff. Uh, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Uh, the word life here in the Hebrew is the word nephesh, which is where the, it's the Hebrew word for soul. It would be the equivalent if this were in English translation, it would, say, it would uh, be properly uh, soul. And he says, you shall not eat the flesh with its soul, meaning, uh, you know, not that animals have souls and, that are eternal and, and uh, they get to go to uh, little Bambi heaven when they die or anything like that. He's not saying that, but they, there, is, there is within animals this flow of blood that is uh, the key of life. It's, it's, it's the trigger of life. Uh, and there's a reason why it was common in, in uh, ancient cultures to make uh, to actually have blood as part of their religious services. They would eat or drink it or boil in it and all that sort of thing. And so God is saying, don't do that. Don't be part of that because uh, the blood is 
wherein the soul lies uh, as he's looking forward to the day when his son would shed his blood on the cross. And then in verses 5 to 7, he's going to establish the sanctity of life. He's going to show, explain more what he means in verse 4. He says, Surely for your life blood I will demand a reckoning. And from the hand of every beast I will require it. And from the hand of man. And from the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by his own blood shall be shed. By man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you... Be fruitful, fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Uh, one of the things that God does with Noah after the flood when he's bringing them out of the ark is another first that we have here in, in our text is he brings about, this is the first mention of human government, the, the government of man, the, that he's allowing man to have control over the affairs of men. And, and he brings in the idea of capital punishment. You know, he says that there, when a man sheds blood, then by his blood, uh, by man's blood shall be shed. And because when you, when a man takes another man's life who is created in the image of God, you are uh, effectively attempting to destroy the image of God. And so he, he, he is endorsing here in chapter 9 of Genesis what today we would call capital punishment. The eye for an eye and the tooth for a tooth. Um, several years ago when I used to teach a Bible study down at Lexington Prison, uh, we'd go down there every Friday, and we would start off before the Bible study. We just had this kind of a question and answer period. Uh, Christian would go with me, and we'd just sit there. Uh, they actually had set, would set up a table for us where we could sit there, and then the guys would come early, and they could ask us Bible questions. You know, anything that they wanted to ask us. And I'll never forget the, one of the first time, one of the first nights we did this. One of the first questions they asked. There's about maybe 35, 40 guys in the chapel, and one of the first questions they asked is, "What was my view on capital punishment?" And, and I look back at him and I said, you want me to answer that question in a prison surrounded by a bunch of convicts? <laughs> uh, but I, I shared with them what the Bible says. You know, I took them to Genesis 9 and explained it. Um, and, and then I also took them to Romans chapter 13, where in verse 4, uh, God says, for, uh, talking about the human government, he says, for he is God's minister to you for good, the king, or whatever the extension of the king might be. For if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword. And it could be, uh, the idea here is he does not bear the sword of execution in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. I, I think it's, it's pretty clear in the Bible that capital punishment is biblical. But somebody can say, well, yeah, but, but it says in, in Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 20 verse 13, that you shall not murder. And, and the word there is rachsach, which is the word for murder. Uh, and uh, the, this is one of the Ten Commandments, and, and Genesis 20, 13 is repeated three times in the New Testament. Uh, twice Jesus gives it in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 21, and 19, uh, verse 18. And then Paul also uh, repeats it in chapter 13 of Roman, where he's talking about the king having this kind of sovereign control that we should obey the king and the authorities because they're set there by God. And he repeats um, the commandment about thou shall not murder also. And the Hebrew word there is the word phuneo, and it means the same thing. It means murder. It doesn't mean kill, but it means to murder. You shall not murder. It doesn't say you shall not kill. I don't like capital punishment. I don't like it. It's, it doesn't set easy with me. It doesn't settle easy. And I've had people say that they don't believe that we have the authority to pretend to be God, to have life and death over uh, another person. Uh, but God has established that, that we should do so in the fear and trembling of him, but do so in his name. It doesn't mean I like it any better. You know, somebody can say, well, aren't you afraid that someone could be wrongly convicted of a capital crime and then be put to death when they were innocent? Yes. That's probably one of the main reasons why I don't like it. Um, but I would say that the chances of that are much less today in, in America, the chances of that are much less today than they were 4,800 years ago in the time of Noah and his sons, and less than they were in the first century under the Roman Empire. They're certainly less possible today of that um, than they were in times past when God said that this is the way we should do it. Um, 
our system says, as messed up as it is, our system of jurisprudence is the best thing going. And if it was a God's will back then, if he said that that's the way we should operate uh, because a life should be given at the expense of a life, uh, then capital punishment is still biblical. It, it's not a matter of whether I like it. You know, it's not a matter of whether or not it sits well with me. Uh, it's just whether or not uh, it's biblical, and it certainly is. And so God spoke to Moses in verse 8 and to his sons with him, saying, as far as me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants forever. This is him continuing on with the what we call the Noahic covenant. And with every living creature that's with you, the birds, the cattle, every beast of the earth with you, all of, all of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth, and thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all flesh be cut off by the waters of the, of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy uh, the earth. We talked about this last time about the universal flood, the, the whole earth being in the engulfed in the deluge or whether it was a, a, a local thing. And we talked about that quite a bit where there are flood uh, myths in every culture on every continent. Um, and that it pretty is evident that it was a universal thing. But here God says, I will never again destroy all the earth like I've done just now. So I think God would know whether it was a local flood or not. And, and he said it was the whole earth. And he said in verse 12, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that's with you for perfect, perpetual generations. So from this time forward, this is the promise that I'm going to make. I will set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Uh, and it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth, and that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature and of all flesh, that the waters will never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So another first, here we got a rainbow. No, not an uncommon occurrence in, in uh, Oklahoma. And uh, it's kind of cool. I don't know if you've ever seen a double rainbow. But that, this, that's, those are awesome. Uh, this is the first time they've ever seen one. And uh, I imagine it was probably a pretty awesome, uh, old King James says bow. It was probably a pretty awesome bow um, for being the first one. And uh, he says, so whenever you see that, that will serve as a reminder to you that I'm making this uh, unilateral covenant with you, that I will never do that again. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, that the waters will never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it uh, to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. You know, and you know when God says that I'm going to remember it, it's that that doesn't mean that He's got to tie a ring around a string around His finger, you know, so He doesn't forget something, uh, like He forgot to turn off the spigots of the flood and just happened to remember it uh, uh, too late. Um, when God says He will remember something, He doesn't need to set a uh, his uh, an alarm on his clock, you know, on his uh, phone. He's going to remember it. And so God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Um, some say there, you know, there's different guys that argue about, the, 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 there are some covenants that are given to us in Scripture. Um, there's the Noahic covenant, there's the Mosaic, there's the Levitical, there's the Davidic, uh, and so on and so forth. Some of the guys, depending upon how dispensational a person might be, they they would argue about how many there are. Uh, I was reading today, there's anywhere from 1 to 12, depending upon uh, what flavor uh, of, of uh, denomination somebody may be. But this is, I, I would say this is the first covenant that we have in Scripture, uh, and it is a unilateral one. It's, a, it's an unconditional one. It's God just saying, I'm going to do this, and it wasn't conditioned upon uh, man's response. And so now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan, and these three were the sons of Noah, and from all the earth, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Now, this verse can open up a lot of a big can of worms in a lot of different ways. Uh, but there's a lot that we don't know. You know, all we have is what's given to us in Scripture. Was there fermentation before the flood? 
I mean, obviously, you know, he didn't have to get the Wine Growing for Dummies book on Amazon in order to know how to do this. You know, he knew that you could take grapes and, and produce wine from it. But had, was it alcoholic before the flood? I don't know. Uh, it, it, it probably was. I've heard some commentators make a big deal of that and say he didn't know that it was going to do that to him. I, I probably would imagine that he did know. Uh, but this is this is the, the the hiccup in Noah's story. You know, this is the black mark that he has. As it, this is another example that men are but flesh. And and the Bible doesn't really pull any punches when it comes to showing that even the men that God uh, uses uh, have the chinks in their armor. Uh, first time alcohol is mentioned, and it's bringing it's brought forth in a negative uh, sense. Um, you know, it's kind of a hot button topic today about, you know, is it, and I, I get asked this question a lot, is it okay for a man to drink wine with his supper? Or can I drink a glass of, uh, a, a can of beer after mowing my grass on a Saturday? And I, I, you know, to them, I would say, go, you know, that's what you want to do, go for it. But you can't look at the Bible, at, at, at examples that are given to us in the Bible about, you know, Jesus drank wine. We can't do that. We can't, that's comparing apples and oranges. You know, if we lived in the first century in the Middle East, there would be no thing about it, but we don't. We live in the middle of the Bible Belt in the 21st century, and there is a thing about it. You know, if if you guys saw me, if you walked into a restaurant and saw me drinking on a margarita, you wouldn't. Your natural presumption wouldn't be that it was a non-alcoholic. You know, you would look at it and you think, "Oh, there's Pastor Ken slamming down some sauce." Uh, but that's the. You know, I will fail you in many ways. I, if there's anything that I've learned. In, in all of my years as a, as a Christian or as a pastor is I will let you down. You know, I will, I, will, I will fall down somewhere and I will blow my witness, but I will never do it with a drink in my hand. You know, that's one thing that I just, I just know that's not going to happen. Uh, and and I, because I have an example to set forth that I have. Some of these things that I mess up on just because I'm a mess up, I don't have control over that, but I do have control over this. And I, I think that's something that we should all consider. Uh, in our witness to, before uh, the world. I'm not legalistic about it. Somebody asked me if I'm a teetotaler, and I said, no, I just choose not to drink. It's kind of that simple. Um, and if, if you choose to, you can do that with your vegan tofu turkey, you know, if you want to. Uh, but um, just not for me. Ham, the father of Cain in verse 22, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brothers outside. From here on out, he's never called Ham. He's called the father of Canaan. I'm, I'm not sure why that is. I think that's it's noteworthy, though. Throughout the passage, he's called the father of Canaan. And, uh, you know, was this some sort of a lewd act that transpired? You know, is that why this has turned into such a big deal? Was there something that happened between uh, Canaan's father, the father of Canaan, and Noah? If it, I think the Bible would tell us, because as I said, it doesn't pull any punches when it brings out the, the failings of man. So I don't think that's it. Uh, I, I just think, you know, with this, they, they worked for 120 years to build this boat, okay? And every day they'd get up early and they'd work all day long, and as soon as sundown, then they, they would quit. But I can just picture Ham as being the one that didn't get it. You know, he was never into any of this. He was probably the one that was always wanting to knock off early. Uh, he, he was the one that just didn't, didn't quite get into what they were doing here. It wasn't that he wasn't a believer because everybody was a believer. You know, you know they, they didn't argue about it being a universal flood or a local flood. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't have any debates over whether or not uh, God was in charge of things. Uh, it wasn't that, but it just, he just didn't seem to quite understand what was going on. Uh, and he was probably what he did when he walked in and he saw his uh, father all drunk, he was that guy, and you know him, you, the guy at work, or the, he's your next-door neighbor, or he's your, your cousin or somebody, but he's a, he looked at me and he said, and you call yourself a Christian. You know, you, that's the example you said, and you call yourself a Christian. And this is, and Ham would be the sort of guy that would look for opportunities to do this. The, the Hebrew here, where it says that he saw his father, actually in, in the configuration and, and the verb tense here, it means that he gazed for a long time. You know, he looked and he kept on looking. What that means, I don't know, but it wasn't good. And he comes out and he had to tell his brothers about it. He came out and bore a tail. 
as it says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13, the talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. And there's a lot of things that we see and hear and experience that it's probably best that we just keep to ourselves. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, and check, check this out. They were showing so much respect for their father, just the opposite of what Ham, or uh, excuse me, the father of Canaan did, is they put this blanket on their, their shoulders and then they walk in backwards in deference to their dad. Uh, and their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. Uh, you know, if Ham had had a problem with all of this, whatever it was, he should have just taken it to his dad. Yeah, that's just a no-brainer. Noah woke from his wine, and he knew that his younger son had uh, what his younger son had done to him. I don't know what that means. You know, I mean, people with imagination probably take it places that they shouldn't. But there was something uh, that told him uh, what had gone on, and so he said. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, and he shall he shall be to his brethren. Now, if you've got any of the modern English or the old King James, any English translation, and probably other than the NIV, which doesn't do this, but you'll notice that the word be is in italics. New American, New King James, Old King James, they all show it in italics, which means it was inserted by the, the, the translators. It could be uh, that maybe a better translation would be, cursed is Cain. In other words, he's not, we always take it as though he's uttered this curse upon him, whatever that means. You know, I don't know that he had the, there wasn't a voodoo doll that he could poke pins in of Ham, you know, and cause something bad to happen to him. But it could just be a statement of fact. You know, he wasn't saying, you're going to be cursed, buddy, for what you did, or just saying, you know, you're, you're, you're messed up. Cursed is Cain, uh, and, uh, or, or Canaan. Um, and, of course, this, the, Canaan was the father of the Canaanites uh, in the land of Canaan, and they were the first ones to fall before the Israelites. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. And may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Um, and that's how it was. That's how it turned out. And so Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Last of the old timers. You know, as we saw earlier when we were looking at all the uh, life expectancy, ages of the patriarchs, both the uh, uh, pre-flood, the antediluvial uh, people, uh, they all lived to be 900 plus years, uh, and Noah was the last one of that. And it says, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And the sons were born to them after the flood. Now, I know that it would be, you know, one of the things, probably the only reason you guys came tonight is so that you could hear me try to read these names in chapter 10. Uh, but I decided that what we would do instead is that we would just pass the Bible around and each one of you can take turns and let you try to pronounce these names. Okay, how many want to do that? <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do is just fake it, but you won't know any difference. Uh, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Ham, Sh uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer. And I would make a lame attempt at a joke about Gomer Pyle, but none of you would know who it was anyway. So um, his sons were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togrimar. The sons of Javan were Elisha. I know that one, uh, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Now, notice the I am in a lot of these names uh, is plural. And, and so what it is, is talking about a clan or descendants. It's talking about a nation that, that came from these guys uh, more than just simply the individuals themselves. And from these, the coastal coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, and everyone according to their language and according to their families, into their nations. Now, here's a table of nations that uh, kind of, uh, you know, there's, the mountains of Ararat, where we believe that was that, I mean, that's where Ararat is today anyway, whether it was that way 5,000 years ago, we're not sure. Uh, but here are the uh, descendants of Japheth. That's where they kind of migrated to in those early years. And it says the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, uh, Sabtekah, and the sons of Rama were Sheba, 
uh, and Dedan, and uh, my Bible also has a scribal edition of Ramadan and Ding Dong. Um, yours may not have that, though. Uh, and so here is uh, where the Hamites settled, which was basically the land of Canaan and um, northeastern Egypt. If anything else, in the societal, societal evolution of man in the last five millennia, we've learned how to name our kids a little better. Um, and Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So therefore it said, uh, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. So he, I mean, he was, he, he was a household, household name. You know, everybody knew about Nimrod. Now, now check this out. You got Noah, and then his son Ham, who had a son named Cush, Noah's grandson, who had a son named Nimrod, Noah's great-grandson. And in, in just these three generations from Noah, everything that had been washed away, everything that had been destroyed in the flood, in God's judgment against the iniquity of man, all of that had been done away with uh, when we come to Nimrod. Uh, his name, Nimrod, comes from a verb meaning to rebel. Uh, and it says he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. It doesn't mean like he's strutting around in front of the Lord like saying, hey, check me out. It's not that, but it's the word means either against or uh, instead of. You know, he, wanted, he didn't want to be a mighty hunter in front of God. He wanted to be a mighty hunter instead of God. That's basically what uh, the saying said. And verse 10 says, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, which where all the word Babylon comes, uh, nation of Babylon comes from, Era, Akkad, Kalna, and in the land of Shiner, uh, in the land of Shiner, which would be the Mesopotamian, uh, Mesopotamian Valley and the Fertile Crescent area. And from that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, uh, Rehoboth, Ur, and Kalna, and Rezan between Nineveh and Kala, uh, that is the principal city. Uh, and this is the beginning, this is the birthplace of idolatry. This was the very beginning of all idolatry. It had its origins there with Nimrod. Uh, they believe, uh, most uh, historians believe that Nimrod is the Bible name for uh, a Greek dude from, uh, mythological guy from Greek mythology name of Ninus who had his wife was Semiramis. And they had this empire uh, back in the days of uh, yore. Uh, and uh, they were very decadent. They had this, this, uh, celebration that they would do on New Year's Eve where they would take they would take a, a, a young sheep that would have been born during that year uh, and they would raise it up and nurture it and then on New Year's Eve they would pull it apart and eat it raw and this was a way of like turning their backs on the old year and then they, they would get a new sheep and start grooming it for the next year and according to the story uh, Simiramis one New Year's Eve she did that to her husband uh, because she wanted to have his kingdom and there is the story of she had uh, ruled uh, this this uh, um, empire for for several decades uh, as a result of that, and and these two characters became deified in uh, not only the uh, uh, Babylonian religions of that day. They had a son named Bel who became the progenitor of Baal of the Canaanites and so forth. But you can take every idolatry system in the entire world and trace it back uh, to these common origins with Nimrod and and Semiramis. And verse 13 says, Mizraim, another one of his sons, which uh, was uh, uh, Egypt, begot Ludim, Ananim, Le Lehabim, Nafutahim, uh, Parthrusim, Kasalim, from whom came the Philistines and the Kaphtorim, just in case you didn't know. Uh, Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and Jebusite, the Jebusite, that's Jebus, which would later become Jerusalem. Um, Heth was the, the, or the, the Jebusite came from Canaan, the Amorites, the Girgashites, and all the ites. Uh, and afterward, uh, last part of verse 18, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you go toward Gerar, and as far as Gaza, which is where Gaza is today. Uh, and then you go toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zobaim, as far as Lasha. Uh, so I'm sure the people back then knew all those places. Um, these were the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their languages, and in their lands and their nations. And the children were also born to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, which most of the etymologists and the uh, historians and the archaeologists believe that Heber 
is uh, the name Heber. Heber means uh, the people across the river. And of course, with the, all starting there in the plain of Shinar, they looked at everything that would be west of the Euphrates River as the people across the river. And the Heber was the progenitor of what would later be known as the Hebrews, um, the brother of Japheth the elder. And the sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, Aram. And the sons of Aram were Uz. That's the birthplace of, of Job. If you remember, he was Job in the land of Uz. So Uz had founded this land that, where Job later got uh, uh, born. Hul, Gether, and Mash. That's a cool name, Mash. And Arphaxad begot Selah, and Selah begot Eber. Now the Shemites, or today we would say Semites, also include the Arabs. You know, sometimes we talk today about anti-Semitism when that means somebody who is against the, the Hebrews or the Jewish people. But it's kind of funny that the Arabs are Semites also, uh, which I think is kind of neat. And so uh, we have uh, the Shemites added to the uh, table of nations. Uh, and another thing, um, you know, not all Semites are Jewish and not all Arabs or not all Muslims are Arab. You know, they're, they're, sometimes we, we say Arab and Muslim equal the same, but the, they're, they're not. And so uh, to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. The name Peleg means division or to divide. Uh, and this is either talking about the tectonic plates that the earth floats on. You know, we got uh, there's like seven of major ones uh, around the whole earth, and, and they work against each other, you know, they move, and that's what caused their fault lines that divide them, and that causes earthquakes and, and various kinds of upheaval. Uh, and it could be talking about that in the days following the Ice Age that came right after the flood, that in his days the earth was divided. Uh, you know, it could be when the, the formation of the modern continents happened, or it could be talking about what we'll get to next week with the division of tongues. Uh, not sure how the earth was divided uh, in this verse, but uh, and then he had a brother whose name was Joktan, and Joktan begot Almodad and Shalaf and Hazar Mavath and Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, and Sheba. And the second time we've seen the name Sheba for a guy, and I, you know, of course, when it says the queen of Sheba, that's that would have been the area that he founded. But I just, I, I, every time I read the name Sheba for a guy's name, I think of the boy named Sue, uh, that maybe his daddy named him that because he knew he'd have a hard life. Uh, but um, Ophir, Havla, verse 29, and, and Jobab. Uh, that kind of sounds like he's from Texas. Jobab. This is my brother, Jobab. Um, but all these guys were sons of Joktan, and their dwelling place was from Misha as you go towards Zephar. Uh, the mountain of the east. And they were the sons of Shem, according to their family, according to their languages, and their lands, and according to their nations. And these were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood, which we'll come to next week when we see the plain of Shinar with the rise of Nimrod. Uh, and the, the, once again, God has to intervene into man's uh, depravity. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the clearness of your word. We thank you that uh, so many great lessons even learned from a list of names that we can't even pronounce or understand. And talking about places that we can't even uh, comprehend in our mind. And, and yet in that we can see that you are a holy God who doesn't want us to mess around. Uh, and you've been faithful in keeping your word, faithful in preserving your people. Uh, God, we just thank you for all of that. And uh, we would ask, Lord, it just uh, as we look in the days in which we live, in which uh, men once again uh, just uh, does not walk in your fear, mankind, that uh, a culture and civilization that wants to just do things their own way, once again, Lord, we have to wonder how long before it's time for you to intervene. Uh, but for us, Lord, help us to be prepared, help us to be diligent, and help us to be fully prepared with the comfort that you give us from resting in you, that we might be used by you to also bring that comfort to others. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen.
Okay.